would be more successful on Tinder, Agent 47 or Dowd? Agent 47, I think, would not do well on Tinder, but I think would do well on a number of fetish sites that <laughs> I don't Who know like leather of. gloves. This is Versus, the GameSpot show that pits your favourite games, consoles, franchises and hot button issues against each other. This week we've got ourselves a good old fashioned stealth off as we pit Hitman against Dishonored. Specifically we'll be looking at Agent 47's 2016 episodic outing and the two Dishonored games and all their respective DLCs. Fighting for Dishonored is Lucy James, who loves Arcane stealth series so much that she made an entire video about the time travel level, a crack in the slab. And arguing the case for Hitman is Oscar Deus, who wore Hitman's iconic red tie to film this episode, but ended up looking more like a crap Donkey Kong. Each are going to argue the corner for their game over the course of three randomly picked topics, with the overall winner being decided by you, the wonderful viewers. Last week's controversial debate around loot boxes saw Oscar score a monumental victory with 78% of the vote for his argument against the aforementioned containers. Anyway, to vote who you think argue their case better on this episode, we're going to be throwing a clickable poll right here on YouTube, but with that out of the way, let's get into the debate. Hello, mate. <laughs> Hello, Luce. How are you doing? I'm all right. Yeah? Well, I've got a bit of a chest infection, so I kind of feel like, you know, Malcolm's best friend in Malcolm mm -hmm. in the Middle, he like, just like wheezes all the time. Are you sure that's not uh, one of these two's way of poisoning you and getting rid of you slightly? It also, Agent 47's gun is actually pointing at you, which makes you think, doesn't it? I mean, it's pointing. Like, it would go past me, that is terrible shh, aim. Shh, shh, shh. Should we just start? Yeah. Level design. I will go first, because Dishonored and its sequel, Dishonored 2, has some of the greatest level design I've ever seen. The thing that I love most about Dishonored is you can approach it however you like, it gives you all of the tools you need, and it lets you mix and match and do whatever you want. But that's not just, you know, to do with your powers, it kind of does it with it when it comes to levels as well, because there are so many different ways to approach every single objective. And you can, that's what I love about it, is the freedom. Like, it is a sandbox, it is contained, but there are so many different paths throughout each level that make it so interesting and make it so that I want to replay a level because it comes up at the end with this really clever thing. It's like, oh, you did this, you did this, you missed this, you didn't do this, and it just promotes replaying those levels and getting involved and doing everything as, like, many times as you want to. In terms of the actual levels itself, they're so memorable. Like in Dishonored 1, you had Lady Boyle's party. So the, the whole thing in Dishonored 1 is like, you, they pretty much played out very similarly. You would do different things, but the outcome would always be the same. But in Lady Boyle's party, which is like the memorable one, uh, there was a randomization and you weren't sure which Boyle sister it was. And then they took that approach and applied it to pretty much every level in Dishonored 2. One of the levels, it has time travel in it, for example. There's the Clockwork Mansion. Every level had just something about it that made it memorable. And when it comes to the time travel ones, in the past, there were tons of guards and stuff. And in the future, it's obviously all dilapidated. But you had this like clock piece, this time piece that let you see the past as you're trying to navigate it in the future. And on top of that, you've got the Clockwork, so the clockwork Mansion, which is like, you know, pull one lever, oh, an entire floral move. The world design, the level design, everything fits cohesively so beautifully together, and that is why I love the level design in Dishonored 2. I think a lot of what you just said there is, is true for, for Hitman as well, at least the 2016 version. Yeah. I, I think every level in that version is such an amazing sandbox. I think Dishonored and Dishonored 2 I really like. I feel, I feel like those levels are puzzles that you can sort of craft to your own mm. will to an extent. Whereas Hitman, they're, they're already made for you, but they are amazing sandboxes with which you can do whatever you want. And I think a lot more of the agency in those comes from in the player learning each of those levels mm -hmm. so intricately in the... Because the release of Hitman, the 2016 version, was designed around replayability and right. playing them over and over and over again. That's why it was episodic, right? Mm -hmm. Every time you play it again, you learn something new. You either learn a guard's pattern or you learn where targets go at a certain time or you learn that you're learning the layout. They're designed around learning and therefore you get a more satisfying outcome every single time you play it. Whereas I feel like Dishonored, even though it's really good and very well designed, it's well designed for one playthrough and I feel like subsequent playthroughs aren't quite as satisfying. To your point about replayability, I would say that one thing Dishonored has that Hitman doesn't in regards to that is the powers, but that to me massively promotes replayability, as does the fact that they reward you for, you know, the different types of playthroughs you can have, high chaos, low chaos, ghosting, you don't kill anyone, like that to me 
provides the extra challenge. I like the powers in Dishonored, whereas I think in Hitman, the power comes from you yourself and you become more like Agent 47 mm. every time you play it. The other thing I like about Hitman's level design is that it's so well set up for you to give yourself challenges. Like mm -hmm. you can say, I'm only gonna wear his suit. But I feel like that gives you so much more to sort of play with and mm. I love it. But I do like Dishonored as well, it's fine. It's a weird one because we both like, like each other's games. Yeah. But it's a shame we don't like each other. Stealth mechanics. Well, I think Hitman has this one down. Because not only has it got the standard stealth game stuff, enemy indicators, and you can mm -hmm. see where all your enemies are, and you can learn their patrol patterns and stuff like that. The best thing about Hitman is it's kind of up to you when that stealth breaks and when it becomes an all-out action game or mm. if you don't want to break it at all. It's basically up to you. Because of the disguise system, you dress up as a butler mm -hmm. and you can walk around the mansion that you're in freely, mm -hmm. as long as you don't go into any like high-level rooms, for as long as you want. And that allows you to scope out your environment and have more fun with the tools that are given to you at the start of the game. And I feel like that sets it apart from any other game, including Dishonored, because I don't feel like... In Dishonored, it's like, oh, you're wandering around, and if you're seen by an enemy, that's it. Stealth mm -hmm. is broken, and you have to fight them. Whereas mm -hmm. in Hitman, that only happens if you're not in a disguise and you always know that that's going to happen because you're given forewarning you're, you're it tells you that you're trespassing or whatever mm -hmm. so everything's kind of within your control a little bit mm -hmm. i think hitman self is far superior to anything that dishonored has to offer you know yeah great you can blink across a room great i can do that in real life you can't i've seen you run <laughs> the thing i love about so actually what you said there was actually quite similar to how you can approach stuff in dishonored in that there are powers that mean you can walk through areas like in uh, Death of the Outsider, Billy Lurk has a power. She can wear someone else's face and walk around. You have powers like possession, but also it gives you a different power. It gives you um, uh, the, the eye power basically, which is kind of lets you see, if you upgrade it enough, you can see like guards patrol routes. You can see enemies through walls, you can see their cone of vision kind of thing. Again, I keep coming back to this, but that's what makes Dishonored so fun for me, is that it gives you the tools and it just lets you do whatever the hell you want with it. In terms of stealth itself, I think one of the big things that sets Dishonored apart for me is the movement. Like, not just the blink, but the way that Corvo crouches and moves around a level, can turn into a different creature or a different person to be able to move about is so satisfying. I like that there isn't like a mini-map, there's an objective marker you can have on there if you want to. Not only do you have powers, but you can have uh, like bone charms and runes where you can like, I think I've read somewhere it's like hundreds of thousands of combinations of all these different bone charms that give you different powers. And to your point about being able to choose whether to be action or not, you can totally do that in Sonnet. You have a gun, you have a sword, you can go in just all guns and swords blazing if you want to. Do you think it's still fun when you do that in Dishonored? Because I always felt like the sword play and gunplay was a little bit kind of clunky. It's not the ideal way to play, but it's there for you if you want it. I don't want it. Don't want it? No. No. No, I don't want it. I want to sneak my way through uh, all the way to that kitchen and have some food. I'm I, I always wonder about like, characters in stealth games, like how buff their quads and their <laughs> buff must be because they're always like... <laughs> always, always crouch walking. Yeah. Have you tried to crouch walk in real life? It's so it's difficult. It's so horrible. <laughs> it's just not graceful at all. It's like... Uh, Hitman's <laughs> legs must be the size of tree trunks. What's it gonna say? Story slash character. Why did that sound like a radio jingle, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ask. <laughs> Story and characters. So... Again, talking about the changes between Dishonored 1 and Dishonored 2. Dishonored 1, you played Corvo Otano, silent but deadly, like a fart. <laughs> <laughs> plays Corvo Otano, you're a silent protagonist with the idea that you would kind of like pour yourself into him. And the story itself like wasn't that strong, but it was good and it was a great framework for the whole world, which is essentially when it comes to the characters, I think the world itself is one of the strongest game worlds slash game characters ever. Let me tell you for why. So like in the first game, you're in Dunwall. It's like this old, it's Victorian London. It's Victorian Edinburgh. And the world of Dunwall is so interesting. It's like built on whale oil, right? And so whale oil is this precious commodity. But then you come to Dishonored 2 and the story changes, the characters change. You can play as Emily this time, the daughter 
who, after having survived and seen her mother being assassinated, has ro risen up and she's now the empress. And she's, again, trying to make this world a better place. And you're in Karnaka, which is, you know, in this like really windy region. And so it's powered by um, wind power. And it's- Same. <laughs> <laughs> everything about that world is like everything is so beautiful to look at so intricate all of the like the side stories that you read are so interesting that you want to really pour yourself into that world but the framework holding everything together is so interesting and the way that they've basically worked so hard to create this world and just like how it's this great steampunk mix of like the old and the new and I enjoy replaying because I always find out something new that was a very good argument and I agree with Pretty much everything you said there, actually, because mm. I think Dishonored does do story and narrative and characters really, really well. Mm. And I think this is where it differs most from Hitman, mm. where Hitman's narrative is very, very thin, the overarching narrative across the whole game. Mm. The Hitman that came out in 2016 is only a third of a story. Right. Like, there's another two seasons to come. So it's sort of like the first act of a film. But that's what I like about it. I like the fact that it doesn't get in the way. There's a few cutscenes, mm -hmm. you can skip them if you want. You're given enough content context about each person that you're trying to assassinate, but I feel like other than that, the game kind of goes, you know what, you go ahead. You know, we're not gonna get in your way. The thing that I do like is that you can create your own little micro stories within each level. Right. For example, with uh, a couple of different characters, there might be family drama going on, or there might be corporate corruption, and then you just come in and uh, as subtly as a baseball bat over the head, just chop straight through all that. That in itself is, is, is a much more interesting story to me than, oh, there's a princess and she became the emperor and you see, you got said, stolen off me. <laughs> you, when you uh, said you have like enough context to give, to do the assassinations. In Dishonored, I prefer the way that they, like everyone feeds into the bigger picture. Like in the first game, you're assassinating the people who arranged for the Empress's murder. You're, you're working your way up to find Dowd and take him on in his stronghold. I prefer those narrative threads all coming together because it makes the payoff so much better at the end. That's uh, fair enough, but I'll, I'll be honest, a bit like I did with Dishonored's story, I'm bored of hearing you drone on now. Well, uh, I'll just check out the uh, the Hitman movie uh, for more interesting <laughs> notes about Hitman. Let's let's not let's not talk about that movie. Let's do as Oscar says and drift past the horror that is Hitman's cinematic record and onto who you think won the debate. Let us know by voting in our poll in the top right corner of the video, or if you're over on GameSpot.com, put your thoughts in the comment section below. It'll be your vote that decides who wins, so make yourselves heard. Right, time for this week's quickfire round, a series of dumb, fun questions written by the rest of the UK team. Let's see how Oscar and Lucy get on. Who would you rather have run your election campaign? Agent 47 or Corvo Atano? Agent 47, for sure. Because Why? he would just assassinate all of your rival candidates, and so you'd, be, you'd win by default. Who would be more successful on Tinder? Agent 47 or Dowd? Agent 47, I think, would not do well on Tinder, but I think would do well on a number of fetish sites that <laughs> I don't Who, know Like leather of. gloves. Yeah, exactly. That kind, of, that kind of stuff, he'd be a hit. His Tinder bio would just be blank. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And he'd have one picture from the back of his head. Of his head. <laughs> Who do you think is better at hide and seek, Corvo Atano or Agent Forty Seven? Corvo, because he can like you see these like grates we have all over the office. Corvo could be up there right now, and we wouldn't know because he can literally just blink up. That's there. a very good point. Agent I would 47 say Agent Forty Seven doesn't have the verticality. No, he doesn't. But he does have versatility in his disguises, mm. and you never know. He could be dressed up as one of us right now. The red tie. Exactly. The red tie. Exactly. Maybe I'm Agent 47 and this is me hiding in plain sight. If you were an assassination target, what would the price on your head be? I'd be a million dollars, baby. To who? To everyone. I'm worth that to everyone. Could you pull off the Agent 47 chrome dome look? No. No, no I, I definitely couldn't. If I could go grey, that'd be decent, but boldness you, would not... You'd go for the Corvo? Yeah, 100%, but boldness would not suit me. I would... I've got too big a head. Oh, you see, I have the opposite problem. My head is quite small, which is why I, like, puff up my hair a bit to make it look bigger, like a bird, like a bird of paradise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <I> gone. <laughs> 
remember to get your voice heard in our poll or in the comment section below and tell us who you think argued their case better. And if you enjoyed this episode of Versus, make sure to hit that subscribe button as we'll have new episodes of the show every Wednesday. Thanks for watching. See ya!